Welcome to Cheers to Progress podcast, where we discuss strategies and share inspiring messages to help you improve every area of your life and move you closer towards your goals and dreams. I'm your host Zuska Light, and this is episode two with a very special guest, Marisa Peer. Marisa is one of the most recognized hypnotherapists in the world. She's a motivational speaker, best-selling author and creator of RTT, which stands for Rapid Transformational Therapy. Marissa spent the past 30 years working with people, including celebrities, famous actors, directors, rock stars, um, Olympic and professional athletes, CEOs and even royalty and having Marissa here on my podcast is a dream come true because for me becoming an RTT therapist and training with her in person has been incredibly transformational. So in this episode we're going to discuss how to harness the power of your mind to create high level of self-esteem and confidence. Why is it important? and why it's never too late to do that. So without further ado, here's the interview. Enjoy. I am so excited to have you on my podcast, Marissa. You're the creator of RTT, so I don't know anyone who could better explain what is RTT about? Why is it so powerful? I think it's so powerful because it's fast. It's also very powerful because it's based on a system that the mind knows what's wrong with you. And you don't have to spend weeks and months and years trying to work it out yourself. You can just ask the mind to take you back to how, where, and when you got whatever your issue is. And when the mind gives you that information, you can then assess it, work it out, what does it mean? So it's it's a very powerful system. First, you become like an investigator. An investigator looks at information, gathers clues, and makes sense of it. An RTT therapist, is also an investigator they gather information and then once you've got the information you become rather like an interpreter you start to interpret how did this scene then cause this client to have these issues today and then you become almost like an interrupter you must start to interrupt the client's beliefs so the information you might get is i was put up for adoption my dad left when i was two my parents wanted a girl i was the fourth boy blah 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 that's the information the interpretation is i'm not lovable i'm not worthy i don't matter i'll never amount to anything and then you have to start interrupting that belief and then finally become rather like a coder coding in wiring and firing in a different belief because therapy only works to the extent that it changes your neural pathways and rtt is designed to change your neural pathways. Neuroplasticity means that as you're thinking thoughts, you're creating new neural pathways. You're also collapsing the old. So you're creating a new belief, I'm lovable, I'm worthy of love, I'm attracting love, I'm maintaining love. And while you're wiring in those new neural circuits, you're also dismantling the ones that say, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough. And how would you compare RTT to the regular talk therapy? Because I have uh, experience with talk therapy myself. I used to have a horrible anxiety and I used to go to therapy every week and I just haven't seen any results from it until I tried hypnotherapy. I mean, it's not. I'm not wanting to diminish or criticize any other therapist because I think all therapists have a good heart and desire to help people. But talk therapy is long. You know, talking about something, it's all conscious. And if you understand the subconscious knows why you are the way you are, how you got to be the way you are, when you got to be, and even why. So you really want to go into the subconscious. The subconscious is the feeling mind. And most problems we have are emotional. Let's look at overeating. Overeating is not logical. Logical is like saying to an alcoholic, now stop drinking and have a lovely cup of tea. They go look at you like you're crazy because emotions run our behavior. Either you're an alcoholic or a drug addict or you've got issues with binging on the wrong food or even being a kleptomaniac. These are illogical behaviors run by emotion. And the idea that you can logic away an emotion is just, 
doesn't work because emotion is more powerful than logic. Here's a rule of the mind. In a battle between emotion and logic, emotion always wins. Therefore, you're trying to logically look at something run by emotion. And what's much better is to find the emotion behind it and change it. And the second thing I find rather frustrating about conventional therapy is the belief that if someone has a complex issue, OCD, or anxiety, or depression, or bulimia, or anorexia, these are very serious, that's true. Therefore, they need long, complex treatment, that isn't true. You can fix someone with anorexia, or bulimia, or OCD really, really fast, mm -hmm. if and when you get to why you got it, when you got it, where you got it, what was going on when you got it, and in that instant, you can become completely free of it. So for instance, with anorexia, a lot of the treatment is being weighed, being made to eat food. You can't see your parents until you gain weight. You can't make phone calls until you've eaten a full three-course meal. But anorexia is a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And most girls with anorexia don't want to grow up. They unconsciously want to stay a child. It's very seductive. And when you stop eating, the breasts don't develop, the ovaries don't develop, pubic mm -hmm. hair doesn't appear. And again, that's a deeply emotional issue but what you do is find well why don't you want to be a child why did do you want to stay a child what was going on when you made that decision one of my clients she she walked in on her father looking at porn and in that instance thought a thought oh i'd hate if a man looked at me like that i would kill myself it was only a thought but the mind is a genie and your wish is its command. And our mind's job is to make our thoughts real. So when you have a scared child, an authority figure, you also have an imprint. And her imprint was, I never want to look like those women with massive breasts and pubic hair. And I couldn't bear a man to lust over me like that. I wish I could just stay a child forever because it's safe. And, and then she became anorexic. And that's exactly what happened. But when you can unpick that, what you unpick is, oh... When I was 11, I made a decision with the life experience of an 11-year-old. I thought my dad was depraved. Now I see that he was just a normal guy. The fact that he did that doesn't impact the fact he was a great dad. They're two very separate things. So when a client can say, you know, I made a decision that's affected my whole life with the life experience of a 7-year-old, with the knowledge and wisdom of a 6-year-old, and then they can let it go, and it, it's really powerful. That's incredible. That just shows how powerful mm. our mind can actually so be. So powerful. So how can we use our mind for weight loss or for curing depression? Or how do we harness that power of our mind? I think you have to understand your mind's job. It's not to be your best friend. It's not even to keep you happy. It's to keep you alive on the planet against what were once not great odds. So for instance, let's look at weight loss. Even 500 years ago, one of the biggest causes of death was hunger, not war, not disease, hunger. And to this day, our, our primitive brain is very scared of hunger. We're hungry, we feel panicky, we feel stressed, and our mind is going, you're going to eat or you'll die. You could die of hunger. So, so imagine you've gone to work, you're just about to go home, you've got an hour's drive, and you know you've got delicious, healthy food in the house an hour away. And yet the fear of hunger is so scary that we pull into a garage and eat candy bars and potato chips and chocolate bars because we're scared of hunger. That's an evolutionary hack that kept you alive. Being scared of hunger meant you always ate food when you came across it. And to this day, we do that too. We're not hungry. We see something and go, oh, I need to eat it now because nature wired you to need to eat food every time you see it, which was great in primitive times. But now when you see food in the store and in adverts and we're, we're invited to eat food at least 400 times a day, we tend to give in to it. So what can you do because that's your wiring? Well, you have to kind of talk to them and go, hey, mind, I know you're making me feel scared of hunger to keep me alive. And I know you're telling me to eat these potato chips, but I've got some grilled fish and chicken, and I'm just going to wait an hour. And then when you can dialogue with your mind, it dialogues back. Hey, mind, I'm going on a date. I feel like I'm going to die of rejection, but I can't really die of rejection. There's hundreds of people I could be with. I don't need to feel scared. I'd rather feel excited. So the trick is to understand your mind's job is to keep you alive with all kinds of weird behavior, like being terrified of rejection. 
But your job is to talk to your mind. So you, your mind will do its job if you do your job. Your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want. And your job is to dialogue with it much better. Let's imagine you're going to give a talk. Mm-hmm. I'll go to your boss for a pay rise or a promotion. Oh, my God, I'm so scared. I'm dying of fear. I'm not really dying of fear, am I? I mean, come on. I'm going to go and talk to my boss. What's the worst that could happen? He'll say, not really interested. But he could say... This is amazing. So I'm going to choose to feel excited and not nervous. So if you can just do your job, which is putting better pictures and words into your mind, your mind can do its job better. Mm -hmm. Because the way you feel about everything is down to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself, and they're all yours to change. Well, that goes to... You know, your book, because your book is called Tell Yourself a Better Life. So... What does it really mean, tell yourself a better lie? Well, I think having been a therapist my entire adult life, I realized very early on that my client's greatest pain was caused by the lies they told themselves. They may have had a dad that said, you'll never amount to anything, or a boss that said, you're an idiot, or a teacher that said, oh, what happened to you, your brother and sister are so smart, and that's painful. But we can say, well, maybe the dad was having a bad day, the teacher was an unhappy person. But when we tell ourselves lies, they do the most damage because the mind doesn't know or care. Whatever you tell your mind, it believes. If you say, I'm a hot mess, I'm an idiot, I got rocks for brains, or I'm super smart and everyone likes me, whatever you tell your mind, it starts to make it real. The lies are, you know, I've got legs the size of a tree trunk. I've got a butt the size of a house. I've eaten all weekend like an out-of-control train wreck. I, I can't stop eating. If I look at food, I gain a pound. I can inhale something and gain 10 pounds. I'm falling apart. This freeway is killing me. My kids make me want to jump under a train. This is all crazy because that's not real. But if you're prepared to tell yourself a lie, like I'm scared to death of going for an assessment, that's not really true. But if you're willing to tell yourself a lie, why not tell yourself a better lie? I'm going to ace this assessment. My mind goes blank in exams, becomes in exams. I'm so focused. I forget everything becomes I remember everything. I look at food and get fat becomes I got a fantastic metabolic rate. Whatever I eat, I burn it off. Because you see, you can choose. You get to choose to say something negative or positive. You really can choose. But what you can't choose is what you do to your body when you're negative. And if you could look inside yourself and see the inflammation, the cortisol, the insulin you create when you're stressed and negative and anxious, you would to stop those stress and negative thoughts immediately. Why do you think it is so much easier for people to tell themselves the lies that actually hurt them, the negative ones, instead of telling themselves the positive? Well, you know, that's a great question because as humans, we're wired to connect. We're wired to belong. From the minute we're born, we are hardwired to find connection and avoid rejection. And in in the order to belong, we tend to go along with a group. We don't want to go, hey, I'm the smartest person. I'm the most attractive person. I'm the most amazing person. We want to be like everyone else. And so we learn to diminish ourselves and put ourselves down in order to be accepted. And how could someone who feels, let's say, really... Mm, like they don't have confidence. If if I'm really scared talking to camera and mm-hmm. I feel really self-conscious and telling myself I'm confident, I'm confident, just doesn't feel right. It's like, mm. that's not me. Sure. Well, you know, one of the most vexing things about the mind is it is hardwired and super coded to return to what's familiar while running away from what's unfamiliar. So if you spent a long time saying, I'm a nervous person, I'm an anxious person, I'm an insecure person, I'm a blusher, I'm a stutterer, I'm a stammerer, what happens is the strongest force is that you must act in a way that matches up with how you identify you. The strongest force is that we act in a way that matches how we have chosen, although we might say I would never choose that, but how we've chosen to identify ourselves. And then it becomes so familiar, we go back to what we know. 
So what do you do? You have to just change it a bit. If you can accept, because it's true, the way you feel about everything is because of the words you use and the pictures you use, then you get to see, well, you can change the words and pictures. You can start to say, say you say you're nervous. What's the opposite of nervous? Excited. And actually, the feelings are the same, that feeling in your stomach. If you go to a fun fair and see people screaming on a ride, are they screaming because they're scared or excited or thrilled? We don't know. It's the same. And so you just have to learn to interpret the things a little differently. So let's imagine you are feeling nervous and anxious and not confident. And you start to say, you know, I feel good. I feel confident. I feel self-assured. You might go, but it's not true. But your mind doesn't know it's not true. And the mind learns by repetition. So repeating it over and over and over again means that it actually very quickly becomes true. And then you start to make that familiar and as you make being confident familiar, you're making being anxious unfamiliar. And it's not really hard work, it's just a little practice of thinking, how do I feel? And how do I want to feel? What's the difference? Could I, I, I could say I'm, I'm falling apart here, I'm a hot mess. Or I could say, you know, I'm self-assured, I'm secure. And you might go, it's not true, but neither is the fact that you're a hot mess. That's not true either. You're just a little uncomfortable, a little anxious, a little insecure. So start to change the words. Minimize the negative. Instead of saying, oh, I'm, I'm just a hot mess, I'm falling apart, I'm a train wreck, I'm falling to pieces, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone. And I've decided to be super confident. So you want me need to maximize the positive, minimize the negative, and what will happen very quickly, which is so lovely, is it stops being what you say and do, and it becomes who you are. And it actually doesn't take long. It takes between 10 and 20 days for the mind to give up an old belief mm -hmm. while embracing a new one. And in fact, you get to change twice every single day. The first change is if you change the words you're speaking then that will change your actions, your words shape your reality. Just making a little change in your language changes everything. I'll give you an example. My little girl used to go to school, and she'd often come back. And I'd always say, what have you remembered? She goes, oh, Mommy, I've remembered my lunch. I've remembered my sports game. I never said, what have you forgotten now? Oh, my God, you always forget. I go, what have you remembered? And she began to think of her mind as an amazing thing. As she got to the gate, she'd remember and she'd come back rather than, oh no, what's wrong with me? Every day I forget. So little tiny shifts can have really profound effects on how you feel and how you act. Yeah. I love that example because I feel like children really need to be encouraged. Yeah. And from my clients, because I'm an RTT therapist, and I have to say it's the most fulfilling job it's I've amazing, ever had. It's isn't amazing. It? Good. I've, I've met so many amazing people already through this. Mm. And I just can't tell you how many people get uh, abused from their kids so emotionally, mm. um, physically, sexually. It's just too much. But. Um, the, even little things that the parents might tell the kids mm. to, just to keep them in line they may not even mm. mean any harm with it yeah. it just matters because it, it can change that person's mm. life completely right yeah when you know that's the problem that even if you have I mean most parents don't plan to mess up their kids lives most parents want to give them a great life but they're such victims of their own trauma and stress and they do the best they can, and often that best is woefully inadequate. The problem is that when a parent isn't meeting a child's need to feel loved, safe, secure, and connected, the child doesn't stop loving the parent, they stop loving themselves. They begin to think, oh, my dad doesn't have time for me because I'm not worthy. So my mom isn't kind to me because there's something wrong with me. My mom doesn't love me because I'm not good enough. And once they buy into the not enoughness, is something they can carry with them their entire life. And it's a terrible shame. It's like, for instance, people say, you know, I was given up for adoption, therefore I couldn't be, my mom didn't love me when the truth maybe that mother loved her so much. And that's why, oh, my dad never visits me because I'm not worth it. And I've met many dads who say, I never see my kids. Why not? Well, they're better off without me. You know, I'm no good. I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I figured if I just walked away, they'd be better off. And 
they could make that choice, but the child can't. And it's a terrible shame how the slightest little thing, you know, for instance, mum taking you to school on the first day and turning away because she's got tears in her eyes and walking off and the child's like, oh, she can't wait to leave me here. She doesn't want me. She just shoved me into the school gates and disappeared because she's glad to be rid of me. None of that is true, but you see, it's not the event of the mother saying, go to school and pushing you to the classroom. It's the meaning you attach. And many mm -hmm. kids whose parents are working three jobs just to get by say, yeah, but if they loved me, they'd be, and they're always at that place called work. Therefore, they must love work more than they love me. Mm -hmm. So how do we change these interpretations now as adults what would be the best way to go about it you know it's never too late to have a happy child one of the things you must do as an adult is to take some time and to think if I had great parents what would they say if I had amazing parents what would they say to me and that's not hard they'd say I love you how lucky am I to have you the joy of my life is parenting you You're the best kid any parent could have. I'm proud of you. You're funny, you're smart, you're amazing. I love spending time with you. And even if your parents never said that, if you can start to say it to yourself, the mind can't tell the difference between what's real and imagined. The mind doesn't go, oh, you're making all this up. It says, oh, finally, here come the words you've been waiting for your whole life. And just like putting balm on dry skin, those words have a very nourishing, restoring effect. So if you're an adult who's missed out on a happy childhood, mm -hmm. tell yourself all the things you'd like to have heard as if they're real. If you are a parent and there's no way to get it right all the time, apologize to your kids when you get it wrong. Say, you know, darling, mommy lost it today. Mummy was cranky. I'm so sorry that today I was cranky. My little girl said, morning, Mummy, are you having your pyramid today? Because you're being very mean. And I said, yeah, you know, I am, and I'm really sorry. Because I'd say, you know, darling, Mummy had a period today. Mummy was a bit irritable, and that wasn't your fault, and you deserve better. I'd always own it so that she wouldn't think my mum doesn't love me. She'd go, my mum's going through some weird thing called a pyramid. My mum's <laughs> got a headache. My mum's got a difficult client. You know, kids are able to understand that life isn't perfect as long as you can tell them it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's not about you at all. And then the other thing as a parent is all your kids ever want is for you to be present with them. You know, I spent so long try writing books to give my daughter a better life, to send her to private school, but all she wanted was me to be with her. And one day I said, you know, darling, I'm writing this book to give us. She goes, but mommy, I don't want that. I just want to be with you. Mm. Because that's all they want. They want you to be present with them. And as hard as it is, switch off your phone. Be present. You know, make dinner together. Sit yeah. down. Be with them. And just be in the moment. You know, if I could rewind my life, I'd have been much better at that. Because they don't really care about stuff. You know, my happiness with my gran picking berries and making jam. I mean, I never did that with my mother. But for me, with my gran, time stood still. She didn't have money, but we'd bake together and do things and go for walks. And that was just so perfect. I never needed to buy. I didn't need to buy. I remember she took me to a store once and said, I wish I could buy you stuff. But I didn't want anything. I just wanted to be with her. I didn't need any. And I can remember vividly saying, but I don't want any of it. I just want to be with you. And so with children, you need to raise their sense of self. I mean, your job as a parent, here it is, you must raise kids with healthy self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So how much organic broccoli you give them or how much money you're spending them to have Mandarin lessons or piano lessons or how much you're spending on their education or their holidays, the number one thing you must give a child is healthy self-esteem. How do you do that? Well... Every day you say to them, like, hey, what did you do today that was great? Nothing. Now, I know you did something. I shared my pencils. That's right. What else did you do that was great? And you praise them a lot for stuff you see them doing. Like, you don't say, oh, you're brilliant. You say, I notice how kind you are to your sister. I notice how good you are with a dog. You're really good with a dog. Or I notice how good you are at reading hard words. You pick out little things. Mm -hmm 
that make their self-esteem grow, that make them feel good about themselves. And when they mess up, you don't go, you're a horrible kid. You're so mean or naughty, you see. What's going on with you? You're a good kid. This is not you being mean to your sister. What's that all about? And they'll say, oh, you like her more than me. Why do you say that? You said she was the favorite. I said, no, I said she was my favorite daughter. You're my favorite son. I said she was my favorite little girl. You're my favorite bigger girl. So you allow them when they mess up. Rather than say you're so bad, you say, what's happening to you today? What's going on? And if they know that you're not judging them, they'll tell you everything. And then you can deal with that. Lack of self-esteem. You mentioned lack of self-esteem. That could be an issue for kids, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I can see that in many, many adults. I've been dealing mm. with that myself. Do you think, is that one of the most common reasons for, let's say, depression? Yeah, depression. One of the reasons we have depression, one of the main re things that causes depression are harsh, hurtful, critical words that we say to ourselves on a daily basis. You're going to go, oh, look at me. I look awful, I'm a mess, I'm an idiot, I don't have any good food in the fridge because I'm so stupid, and I, I didn't have a map, I've got lost because I'm an idiot. And we would, if we talk to our friends the way we talk to ourselves, they would leave. So you've got to just know how you speak to yourself. How harsh are you? How critical? How diminishing are you? Harsh, hurtful, critical words that you use about you almost guaranteed to give you depression. And there are other things that cause depression too, being disconnected, not being able to follow your heart's desire. Mm. But all of these things are fixable. You can immediately stop the harsh, hurtful, critical words and start using nurturing, nourishing, praising words. If de failing to follow your heart's desire is causing depression, think of, well, how could I fit that into my life? And if disconnection is causing an epidemic of depression, which is, how can you find connection? And the other thing is, with children whose needs are, they often join gangs. You know, they join mm -hmm. gangs to belong. They join gangs that fight, or they join some kind of gang, or they join a cult, because their need to connect is so powerful. And addicts, too, will connect to a needle a gambling table, they'll connect to anything. So as you go through life, make sure you have connections and make sure your children have connections. I always worry when parents say, I'm homeschooling my kid, an only child too, because one of the reasons you go to school is to socialize. And I can see many people are doing much better with homeschooling, but you have to have like a day out at the museum where other homeschooling kids go as well because you've got to be very careful not to disconnect your children. They need connection, like they need good nutrition. That is absolutely true. Mm. I didn't go to kindergarten because my mom, she couldn't leave me there because I was crying. Mm -hmm. So she decided I'm not going to go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And then when it was time to go to first grade, I was devastated. I was the only kid crying in the mm. class that my mom yeah. left. Yeah. And I was not used to other kids. Mm. Yeah. So socializing is super yeah. important for kids. Um, I want to ask you because you worked with uh, a lot of celebrities, famous people, people who were really accomplished people who are really confident or at least appear very confident, how is it possible for someone who's so confident to have a lack of self-esteem? Because it's an act, you know, that's not who they are. They step on stage, they put on the dress. The, we saw the Whitney Houston, you know, she could go on stage and deliver the most powerful music that would bring tears to your eyes. We also saw that with Amy Winehouse, who could write the most incredible lyrics, really profound. When you listen to that song about laughed at by the gods, love against the odds, love is a losing game. You saw the intelligence of that girl and her understanding of Greek mythology and very smart. And yet she felt utterly worthless. So just as a dancer can go on stage and dance, an actor can go on stage and act, and a singer can go on stage and sing, but that's what they do, it's not who they are. Many of them, I've met many actors say, I could never walk into a bar on my own. I couldn't go to a restaurant on my own. I can play the part of someone who walks into a bar on their own, 
but it's really not me. And so we think that famous people become damaged by fame. But I found it to be quite the opposite. Damaged people are drawn to fame. Mm -hmm. They have a powerful drive to find fame because they don't feel enough and their belief is if I'm famous, everybody will love me. If I'm famous, I'll have friends, I'll have adulation, I'll be someone, I'll mean something. And they're often drawn to theater, music, drama, sports, politics, because of their need to be loved. But even when they get it, it doesn't really mean anything because they already believe they're not worthy of it. So they can't really take it in and let it in. So I don't think people are damaged by fame as much as damaged people are drawn to fame because they believe it's the only way they could ever feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not about finding people in life that love you, that will love you and support you and encourage you. It's more about giving that to yourself. I think it's a great thing to find people who love you and support you. The irony is that when you love and support yourself, you easily find people that follow your lead because you're already showing them mm -hmm. that you are worthy of love and support. But when you go out going, oh, I need to find someone to love me and I need to find someone to praise me, I need to find someone to make me feel good about myself, it actually kind of backfires and it doesn't really work because neediness is very off-putting and confidence is very reassuring. I have heard a lot of people say that affirmations, positive affirmations don't work. But what I'm hearing you say is that it's about the repetition. Yeah. Right. And so it seems like people just give up and they because they feel right away that oh, I'm just lying to myself. It's not true, true that I'm confident. Mm. So it's all about the repetition that makes it stick eventually. And we, sh we should just believe that our mind is taking mm. it in. Well, there are affirmations and there are affirmations. An affirmation that says every day in every way I'm getting better and better is too abstract. Better and better at what? We could mm -hmm. say better and better at shoplifting or better and better at giving myself headaches and I have to go to work or better and better at lying to people. So when you're making an affirmation, it must make a very clear picture. The mind loves words that are visually descriptive. Mm -hmm. So even if you said, I want more money, what does that mean? You could find five bucks on the street, but I, I want love. What kind of love? Who do you want love with? How long for? Do you want that wild, passionate, crazy love or a different kind of love? So it, they do work, but the mind responds to p words that make a visual picture. So if you let's say you had an affirmation, I'm attracting lots of attention. Well, you can get that by having a nervous twitch or having explosive gas, and I'm sure that's not what you want at all. So you've got to be very clear with the mind. You've got to be crystal clear. I'm worthy of attention for being a great speaker. I'm worthy of attention because I'm lovable and I'm significant and I matter. I'm attracting the most deep, lasting, enduring love with someone I love who loves me back and we respect each other, we adore each other, we grow a lifelong relationship together. It makes a good picture. Mm -hmm. I've got a gift and I'm monetizing that gift by really marketing what I'm good at. I've got a gift for IT or writing or art. And so when you can be very clear with your mind, it will go after what you want, but you've got to make sure it knows what you want. You know, I want attention means I got chronic migraines. I'm at the doctors every week getting loads of attention, but that's not what I wanted at all. So you've got to say, I want attention for. And I find rather than say affirmations, I prefer to say statements of truth. Mm -hmm. If you say every day I'm going to make a statement of truth about myself, but I get to choose what the truth is, I could make a statement. I'm magnetically lovable. I attract love. I maintain it forever. I find people who love me, I love them. Or you could say... I'm really smart, I'm super intelligent, I've got a fantastic memory, I'm interested by so many things. And if you keep repeating that, it will become true. It's like saying, if you say that I've got a chronic headache, it's throbbing right here. If you keep saying that, you'll make such a vivid picture of what it is that you'll start to get a throbbing headache. So because your mind responds to the words and pictures, 
make a statement of truth about yourself that you want and use powerful words, powerful pictures, even the words in front of words. Instead of saying I'm lovable, say I'm amazingly, powerfully lovable. I'm magnetically, irresistibly lovable. I'm constantly, consistently lovable. Put words in front of words. Mm -hmm. Make all those words positive and exciting. Make it in the present tense. Sometimes affirmations don't work because you say, next year I'm going to be a millionaire. Well, first of all, the mind doesn't know what next year is, and it doesn't really know what a millionaire is. You have to say, right now I'm monetizing a gift. I've got a gift, and I'm monetizing this gift, and I'm becoming super successful, and I'm becoming wealthy because of what I'm doing. But saying, next year I'll be slim, next year I'll find love, next year I'll find success... And you don't find love or success. Mm -hmm. It finds you. You believe you're worthy of it, and it finds you. That sounds very powerful. You believe you're worthy, and it yeah. finds you. Yeah. That's really, really powerful. So if somebody's <coughs> going through challenges, really difficult times, how else they can use their mind, the power of their mind? To well, overcome? you know, we all go through difficult times. That's what makes you stretch and grow. I mean, most teenagers have been dumped they failed at exams and if you have a charmed life and a perfect life where nothing goes wrong you're not really prepared for the hardships that come along and so maybe it's unreasonable to expect life to be perfect but when you have a challenge you have to go well I'm learning from this one day I look back at this what can I get from this how can this be of any benefit it's difficult when you're right in it but then you have to use that expression this too will pass because it does I think for something to get you, it has what I call PPP. For something to really hurt you, it has to be personal, meaning it's all about you. It has to be all pervasive, meaning it's going on all the time, and it has to be permanent, meaning it's never going to end. So let's imagine you've got a baby that keeps you up all night, or a boss that's particularly mean and cranky. Is that personal? No, because that boss is mean and cranky with everyone. Is it permanent? No, you're not going to work with him until the day you die. It's not even all pervasive when you're having sex with your partner, lying in the bath, having a lovely dinner. It's not actually going on. Your difficult teenager, that's not permanent. They leave home. It's not personal. They like that. It's not even all pervasive because, again, when you're doing other things, and they're not difficult every minute of the day. So if something is bothering you, bugging you, hurting you, ask yourself the three Ps. Is it permanent? Is it personal? Is it all pervasive? If the answer is no, It, it really is very temporary. So what advice would you give to someone who's been held back by lack of self-esteem, lack of self-confidence, and haven't been following their dreams? I would say it's never too late. You know, some of the most successful people in the world came to success much later in life. You know, we're, life is long. We live a long life, and it doesn't matter what you wasted in your teens or 20s, even in your 30s. You've got a lot of time. You know, nowadays you can go onto YouTube and learn anything with a YouTube tutorial. It's no longer true that you have to go to college and have a degree to be successful. It's no longer true that you need to come from money to make money. People have come from nowhere. With, I mean, look at someone like Tony Robbins. Look at Oprah Winfrey. Mm -hmm. They certainly didn't have privileged lives. They didn't have money behind them. They didn't have Harvard behind them, and yet... There they are now, and there's many people like that. Every month we're seeing people now who've come from nowhere, self-educated, self-made. And if they can do it, you can do it. So it doesn't matter where you came from. It only matters where you're going. It doesn't matter what your beginnings were like. Sometimes having the worst beginnings give you what I call an I'll show you attitude. I mean, look at Ed Sheeran. You know, he was sleeping in park benches. He was busking just to try and make it and was told, Ed, don't really look like a rock, so you've got lily white skin, ginger hair, big milk bottle glasses. But he was determined and he showed you that you don't have to look like a conventional rock star to be a rock star. You don't have to be tall, dark and handsome. And some of the people we see, I mean, Adele wasn't a conventional-looking pop star at all, but that voice, and she had a horrible beginning. She didn't see her dad. She lived in a little welfare house. They had no money. But she had a, a vision. And I believe that belief without talent will take you further than talent without belief. You can have all the talent in the world, 
and no belief and you probably won't make it. You can have incredible self-belief and not much talent. Look at all these reality TV stars. The only thing they have got is belief. I'm amazing. I should be on air. I mean, look at the Kardashians. And that's not to put them down. It's saying if you have belief, you can go anywhere and do anything. That's not the same as um, delusionment. I'm going to be a brain surgeon. It's not that. It's a powerful belief. I've got something to offer the world. The world's interested in me. The world's going to respond to me. I can monetize a gift. I can run a business. I can create something amazing. Because some of the things we buy, I mean, who would have thought Anastasia could make millions out of eyebrows. Who would have thought, you know, you'd buy bottled water and ringtones and people could monetize something so simple. My grand wouldn't have believed you could make money from sour milk, but you know, we love yogurt now. We pay a lot of money mm -hmm. for mountain water, Norwegian water. And so you just have to take a look at who's out there and what are they doing. You know, look at what are people doing, where have they come from. When you look at the rich list, look at the people who are self-made, look at the people who've come from nowhere with an eye and think, well, if they can do it, I can do it. If somebody can do that, then I can do it too because that's what self-made people do. They give you hope. They tell you their story. Mm -hmm. I came from nowhere. It was a real rags to riches. But I had an idea, I had a thought, I kept going. And then it's, it's better. And also realize that if you're given a talent, you're never given a talent without the support. The universe doesn't give you a gift. It didn't put Frank Sinatra on the planet to be a plumber. It didn't put Barbara Streisand here to be a nail technician. If you're given a gift or a talent, the world that gave you that will support you in, in making a success of it. But I think we've sort of lost our way with the hard work thing. We've all believed we can manifest and read the secret and it will just fall into our laps. It's not quite like that. If you want success, you've got to do three things. The first is you've got to really, really believe you're worth it because you'll come against rejection like Ed Sheeran. Mm -hmm. The door shut in his face. He just knocked on another door. Eminem, when they said, Eminem, you can't be a rapper. And even looked like a rapper. But he said that rejection made him so angry, it just gave him the bounce back factor. So believe you're worth it, because you'll need that belief when you come up against adversity. Success isn't never failing, it's how fast you get back up again. If you believe you're worth it, you get back up. After all, Harry Potter was rejected over and over and over again, but she believed that this was a story that must be told. And she keeps sending back, David Bowie was laughed at. He believed he must be heard and he came back again. There are many people who have been told you're not going to make it, that's not going to happen, but they came back. You know, One Direction, the richest boy band in the world, came third in a comp. But they didn't go, oh, we didn't win. They believed they were worthy of success. After you've done the first bit, the second bit is to really know what success looks like for you. What is it that you really, really want and what does it look like? You have to look and look again. Like I could say what I want was to write books. That's quite easy writing a book. But if you look at what does being a best-selling author mean, it means a lot of going around to do book signings. If you want to be a writer, you better learn to be a speaker too because now you've got to talk about your book and do blogs and go on interviews. And if you can't talk about your book, it's much harder to sell it. So when you look at what you want, you see, oh, there are other things I'm going to have to learn and acquire. And when you've done all of that, you can do the third thing, which is hard work. And we've kind of forgotten and think, oh, I didn't know I had to work. I'd, yeah. You gotta work really hard. You want a business, you're gonna stay up all night writing your business plan, talking to your customers, working on your website. I mean, I wake up every morning. My husband always laughs because I have hundreds of emails out and I do them in bed because then I never feel like it's work. And he says, you're always on the phone. I say, yeah, but if I just keep doing a bit here and there, they never catch up on me. So believe you're worth it. Be really clear on what it looks like look really deep into what you want and then be prepared to do whatever you need to do to take to get there and that might mean getting up early working late working weekends on the way to success there's a lot of work when you've made it you take lots of time off
So how can somebody go from years of not believing in themselves at all and just not having that in them, feeling like I don't have that? Oh yeah, of course, that's a Sheeran because it's a Sheeran, but I'm no a Sheeran. So what would you tell them where to start, where well, to just... You know, not, not everybody wants that, you know, for a lot of people. They want a very simple life, which is very... There's a lot of good things, but I want to be home with kids, make lovely dinners, go for walks with my dogs, live in the country, and I can see the joy of that. So we don't all want fame and success. Some of us just want joy and peace. But if you want it, the first thing is to look at other people who've got it and then to realize what's different about them. Because the difference between people who fail and people who succeed is actually not a lot. People who succeed will do five or six things differently. The first is they are willing to do what they hate to do to get to where they want to be. And they also, they do what they don't want to do first. If you can do what you don't want to do first, that will mark you out for success. The third thing they do is they take action every single day in the direction of their goals. That doesn't mean they work seven days a week. It means even on their day off, they watch one YouTube tutorial. They, they answer a few emails. They, they do something. So they do what they don't want to do. They do it first. They take action every day in the direction of their goals. They don't take no for an answer. They get rejected. You know, um, Celine Dion was told she would never make it as a singer. Um, oh God. Meryl Streep was told she'd never make it as an actress. So they, they refuse to hear no. They have what I call the bounce back factor. And the fifth thing they do is they delay gratification. They constantly work on where they want to go. And the last thing they do is they praise themselves a lot while the whole world is saying, like, there's a very famous about Celine Dion sending a cassette to Sony. And she called them and said, what do you think? They didn't like it. She went, oh, you never played it. If you'd played my cassette, you would never say that. So you see how good they are at praising themselves. I have an amazing voice. I'm an incredible singer. You need to listen again. You rejected my manuscript. You need to read it again. It's really amazing. Because J.K. Rowling, every time that manuscript came back, and I know that being a writer, the thud. And when you hear the thud, you know that's your manuscript. They don't send it back if they want it. Actually, nowadays, they email them. But I remember 15 years ago, that thud going, oh, that's my manuscript coming back. And now I have a choice. Shall I just put it in the bin or shall I put it back and send it to someone else? That's the taking action every day. Mm -hmm. So let's use that as an example. I hear the thud. Oh, my book's been sent back again. What do I hate? I've got to pick it up, repackage it, go back and send it again with a covering letter to a different publisher. I don't want to do that. I'm going to do it. I've got to take action doing that all the time. I've got to really believe it's amazing. If someone wrote to me and said, I don't like it, I might have to go and say, but could you tell me why you don't like it? Where is it weak? What could I do? Could you give me some advice to make it better? So you've got to be willing to do that and hear what they tell you. And then you do the work and keep working on it. You know, my first book was rejected. And then the same publisher that rejected it offered me maybe 10 times more what they'd offered me the first time because I was in a bidding war, but I went to someone else. So it was the same book. It was rejected. I kept sending it back. And then I got an agent who just took the same book and sent it out and got a bidding war. And the same company that said we don't even want it would have given me... I think I was offered 10,000 pounds. Then in the end, I got 130,000 pounds. So that's a lot more than 10 times. But it was the same book. And what was different, nothing really, except I kept going. It was hard at times, but that's the mark of success. You keep going. You don't take no for an answer. You do what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. You don't give yourself a day off. You wait until the book's published, and you can have lots of time off. But if these are habits... You make your habits, and then your habits turn around and make you. Then you have to start acquiring those habits. They may not be natural, but neither is shoving a contact lens in your eye. We do lots of unnatural things, and you can adopt those habits. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you'll feel like you've always had them. You have written six books already? Yeah. Yeah, and your latest one is Tell Yourself a yes. Better Lie. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah. When I looked at therapy, 
I wondered how much the therapy benefited the therapist and how much it benefited the client. And it might sound a hard thing to hear, but having a client come in every Friday at two o'clock for two years definitely benefits the therapist because they've got regular income. But I wasn't sure it really benefited the client. And I just wanted to create a therapy that was all about the client, that was fast, that was effective, that was good for them. And so I created our TT rapid transformation. So many therapists say, you know, that's wrong. You tell people that they can change. That's not right. Well, why is it not right? From the minute we're born, we're all changing. And so I think I went out on a limb, and that was the same thing. I went out on a limb. I did what wasn't comfortable. I had to keep going. A few times I was... Um, I had a couple of people who would kind of attack me for what I'm doing and say, oh, you're just a fraud and you're a scammer and all the things people say when they don't understand you. But I had to think, well, you know what? I know that's not true. I know in my heart that none of that's true, so therefore I can keep going. And it was very important for me because clients would say things like, you know, you changed my life. That thing you did, that thing you said, that thing you made me say, that one little thing you did was a game changer. But each client would come back with something different that they said changed their life. So I began to collect all the things that I was doing that people would say, oh my God, that one thing. And then I put together rapid transformation, although we began teaching it, because people think it's me, oh, you're just a really good therapist. It's actually the formula. It's a bit like if I said to you, look, here's an amazing recipe, it's incredible, but if you follow it bit by bit, you'll produce something pretty good too. So I have created a formula, a recipe, if you like, that I could teach, and I've now taught 13,000 people, you're one of them all over the world, how to be an amazing therapist, how to really get results, how to get stunning turnaround in clients. Because really, what do therapists want? They want to make a difference. What do clients want? Well, they want to be out of pain as fast as they can. Is that physical pain or emotional? It's all pain. Mm -hmm. The pain of having migraines or irritable bowel or blushing. The pain of never finding love and never finding success. The pain of, of being phobic or insecure. They're all pain. And if you turned up in ER in pain, they take you out. I mean, if you turned up with the dentist in pain, they take you out of pain. And so I thought therapy should really be like going to the dentist. They should be saying, what's wrong with you? I can fix that. I can take you out of pain today. You may have to come in a few more times, but I'm going to remove your pain today. So it was very important for me to create a therapy that was a very effective way of removing pain. And that's what ITG is. It won so many awards in its first year. And we got so many people we train. We train doctors and psychiatrists and nurses and counselors and therapists who say, you know, this is the missing bit. This is what I've wanted. And then many people who go to a therapist like you or will say, oh, this is so amazing. It's so transformational. I want to learn to do it. You know, I'm just at the moment doing my new um, program, Dietless Life, and people are saying, oh my God, it's amazing. After the first week, I'm not binging, I'm not thinking about food. It's all so easy. I want to learn how to do this for other people. So eventually we'll create a Dietless Life coaching program. Because when people think, wow, everything you've just done in the last couple of weeks has changed my relationship with food. They then think, wow, wouldn't it be great to help other people? So yeah. that's what I'm doing right now. That sounds super exciting. So can you, can you tell us more about Dietless Life program? Well, you know, I started off working for Jane Fonda in the, you know, in, in LA in the late 80s in the aerobic boom. And even then, I, I always saw that the dieting industry is based on abuse. We talk about punishing workouts, punish those pounds, go on a strict diet, go on a starvation diet, live on powdered soups and shakes and re meal replacement bars. And we call f food sins. <laughs> and naughty, and I've been bad, I've been good. And it's all based on self-hatred, that whole thing about getting weighed, shaming yourself. And I never really understood that because the only way you can ever have a body you love is to love the only body you'll ever have so much that you treat it with respect. You think, okay, I love my body. Do I really want to start the day with Pop-Tarts and a can of Coke? Is that love? No, that's abuse. 
People say, oh, I love food, me. You know, I love pizza and ice cream and mocha chocolate for everything. But that's not love. That's abuse. I know you think it's love, but it's actually abusive to your body. Your body doesn't go, hey, knock me out with chemicals, colorants, preservatives, pesticides, emulsifiers. It's only the mind that wants that stuff because it's so addictive. It's like crack cocaine. So I was always aware that this whole overeating thing is is formed by the mind. Overeating is an emotional problem. You can't fix it with dieting. You can't say to someone, hey, let me take away all the things you think you love. Let me take away the chocolate, the cakes, the biscuits, the cheese, the toast, the bread, and you can have salad and vegetables and fruits because it doesn't work. If overeating is an emotional issue and an act of regression, which it always is, no one says, oh, I'm so hungry, I think I'd like some lettuce. They want to regress back to milky, fatty, creamy foods that almost have that memory of mother's milk. And so I wanted to come at it from that reason. What makes you overeat? What are the feelings that are causing you to overeat? Why are you addicted to dieting? There are eight different types of overeaters. And so I wanted to look at why people use food to feel better, why people can't leave food, why they don't recognize what full is, and to come at it from love and to say, look, you can actually reactivate and reset and recreate the relationship with food you were born with, which is there'll always be enough. No baby says, I need more. Mm. Oh my God, I ate too many cakes. I need to jump up and down in my crib to burn off the calories. We're all born because in the womb there's plenty. So we're all born knowing there's enough. And all our bad habits are required, overeating, comfort eating, destructive eating, emotional eating, they're all acquired. But selective eating is what you were born with. So I'm reactivating and remanifesting that. But it's all using the power of the mind. It's not about, hey, go on a diet. Because people will say to me, you know, I've tried everything. I've tried hundreds of things. What are they? Oh, you've tried one thing hundreds of times, which is a diet. And I can tell you diets have, in the, the, the failure rate for diets is in the high 90s. So you haven't tried hundreds of things. You've tried one thing hundreds of times. All these different diets, all these different ways of hating your body and believing you don't shape up. And if you could just fall in love with your body, you start to treat it with respect and care, and then the whole overeating would end itself anyway. Mm-hmm. So dietless life is not a diet. It doesn't even say, never eat this and eat that. It gives you some advice, but it's up. some people say, no, I never want to eat cheese again. They'll say, oh, I want to stop eating at six. I want to eat what everyone eats, but not be run by it. So mm-hmm. it's giving you back what was in you when you were born a normal relationship with food and a deep respect for your own body. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit about shifting the perspective. About well, it's a 12-week program. So every week, you go and every week I, I give you a little, I don't like the word lecture, a lesson on the number one reasons diets fail. It's not what you eat, it's what's eating you. It's not your fault that you're hardwired to remember where sugar is, to eat food when you see it, to be panicky when you're hungry. So each week I teach you something that makes tremendous sense. And then I do a live hypnosis to wire it and fire it and code in the new beliefs while removing the old. It's those neural circuits again. Let's give you new neural pathways about leaving food, and actually preferring healthy food. And at the same time, dismantling the ones that say, I need cake, I need takeouts. I mean, of course you can have cake and takeouts, but you're not going to be run by it anymore. How important it is to remove guilt from, you know, when it comes to dieting and not Well, guilt cake. is manufactured. No baby feels guilty. So I think, you know, guilt is used to make people conform. And I think it's very important to take out guilt. We shouldn't call food naughty but nice this is a sin oh let's have a treat a big dish of ice cream just call it food it's just food mm-hmm. when i used to get my daughter from school i might bring her mangoes or olives sometimes i'd bring her candy but i never called it a treat it was all this is delicious mango these are lovely olives today we got some cookies because it's impossible not to give your kids those. and if you never let them have them they become obsessed 
but I would always try not to label it a treat. Let's have pizza. Let's stay in and order a movie and treat ourselves to chocolate because the next time you're feeling sad and your mind becomes a biofeedback, I'm so sad, I need to treat myself to chocolate. So it's a story, basically, that yeah. we create over yeah. time, usually yeah. as kids. Yeah. yeah. Well, as kids, you know, the th problem is that when children are unhappy, they only have one thing that can change their emotional state. What is it? Food. You know, they can't book a massage, go onto eBay and buy a little something. They can't go to Netflix and download something or call a friend or go for a walk. Or The only thing they can do is put their hand in the cookie jar. And when they learn that that changes their emotional state fast, they continue to do it for the rest of their life. So that's the big problem, mm -hmm. that young children in stress have no out except to eat, to push their feelings down with toast or bread or cake or handfuls of raisins. But once they start to do that and it seems to work, they never know how to give it up. So you've got to really stop that very early. So I have one more question for you, Marissa. It's more about RTT and the schools. Yeah, recently we created this program called the I Can't or I Can Challenge. For years with my adult clients, I've been making them imagine they have a cheerleader in their head instead of a critic, and the cheerleader cheers them on. And we, my sister decided that we should put that into school. She's amazing. And so she created the program, and we began to introduce schools to the concept of installing a cheerleader. And each class would actually design the cheerleader, and each class would make a cheerleader from all the different parts. One would have wings, and another kid would design the legs or the head. And then we made the cheerleader for them, and these children would talk about it like it was really, they say things like, he helps my mental health. He makes me feel good about myself. He lets me know I've, I've done well and I've done my best. And it was actually very moving to watch the video because we were up for an award of these children talking about their cheerleader. And recently I went to bed and I was thinking, well, 600 schools in England have that, and more than that in America, so that's like... 1300 and there's more than that because it's all over the world and I was trying to work out how many children we've impacted and it was so many but it was a really lovely feeling because in the Quran it says if you um, change the life of one person it's the same as changing the world and I think in the Torah it says if you save the life of one person it's the same as saving everyone's life and I loved that because that's probably what's meant the most to me in my entire career knowing that some child, someone's having a better life because of something that I've created, that some kid is doing better at school, better in friendships because of something that my company put together. And so that's been a great sense of joy. But that's a wonderful thing. You know, I think most of us like to put themselves out of business. If we could have a wish, we go, I want to make the next generation so happy. They don't even need therapy. So even though I'm training all these therapists, I'm not really putting them out of business because... That's a big ask. We want to change the world. Mm -hmm. But just change people one soul at a time, one child at a time. So knowing that the I can't to I can challenge is changing how children feel about themselves. It's changing how they are at school, both academically and socially. And most of the schools have come back and said it's, it's extraordinary how quickly this is changing the children. So that's been probably the thing that's given me the most joy. And we're going to go on doing that, putting that in more schools all over the world. It's completely free. We never charge for that. We also have an anti-bullying program that's completely free. And so that's probably been, I got a lot of great joys and wins, but that's probably my favorite. That is amazing. Mm. And it's so needed. Thank you. And so what would you tell parents, advise parents who kind of feel this guilt about maybe not supporting their child's self-esteem as much as they think they should or well you might notice I have all these bracelets on that say I'm enough there's two there yeah. and there's two there and I created the I'm enough movement because I noticed that so many of my clients who came in if I was drilling down to what was wrong with them whether they were addicts or self-sabotaging or procrastinating or unhappy it was always the same I'm not enough. There were different var varieties of that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not lovable enough. I'm not interesting enough. And I realized if that was their belief, and we could flip that to I am enough. So I created the I'm enough movement. We created the bracelets, T-shirts, all kinds of things, pens, books, badges. We started to give all these to schools. And 
it's been amazing. It's another thing that started to dramatically minimize bullying. So get your kids into the I'm enough and have them say it every day. Write it on the mirror, write it on the fridge, make a little placard for them and just get them to say every day, I'm enough. They won't even know what it means, but at a deeper level they will. And it's something so simple, but it's strength, it's in its simplicity and of course it's honesty. So if you want to help your kids, get them to say I'm enough mm -hmm. every day. So you can go you can go to imenough.com and we have lots of stuff that we give away, particularly the bracelets. Go to imenough.com to find out how to know you're enough. If you want to train in our TT or indeed find an RTT therapist that are all over the world, go to rtt.com. And if you want some free downloads, we have downloads on love blocks, wealth blocks, health blocks, money blocks, etc. Go to marissapeer.com. They're free. We don't ask you for a credit card. So marissapeer.com for free audios. I'm enough.com for free bracelets. And rtt.com to either train to be an amazing therapist, like you said, the best job in the world, yes. or to find one that can really help you powerfully and rapidly. Mm -hmm. okay. And Dietless Life, if you want to join that, go. there's a group on Facebook called Dietless Life Information Group. Join that. It's amazing. Well, thank you so much. This was a You're great welcome. interview. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and that you took at least one thing out of this interview because at least one new thing means progress. So cheers to that and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any new episodes and visit my website zuzkalight.com that's Z-U-Z-K-A-L-I-G-H-T dot com and subscribe to my newsletter. And I will see you guys soon. Cheers to progress.